After winning the World Series in 2023 with the Texas Rangers, Mitch Garver hit free agency as the best catcher available on the market. The Seattle Mariners decided to swoop him up from their division rivals and now heads into 2024 with a complete retool to their roster and looking to maybe make a late run into a wildcard spot in 2024. Although Mitch Garver is by no means a good defensive catcher, he has the ability to spell Cal Raleigh if he needs to and will be a very good addition to the Mariners DH spot and likely would be the heart of the order. With solid pieces like Julio Rodriguez, the aforementioned Raleigh, Ty France, and J.P. Crawford, the Mariners have the potential to be a sneaky good team in 2024. Free agent signings are really important for any postseason run. You look at Corey Seager and Marcus Simeon with the Rangers, but equally as important are trades. You look at Adolis Garcia acquired for cash from the Cardinals. You can get a lot of really great gems from making a good trade and being savvy with who you end up trading away and who you end up acquiring. Garver was the first player traded away after the lockout ended before the 2022 season, and he provided some immediate impact for the Texas Rangers. In this video, we'll characterize Mitch Garver's free agency and his time with the Texas Rangers to determine exactly what his value is as he headed into free agency and compare that to what exactly the Seattle Mariners signed him for and see if that was fair value. We'll also look at this from the Twins' perspective and see what they acquired in this deal, how that's panned out for them, and what the future holds for the players that they acquired. As always, if you could drop a like on the video and subscribe to the channel, that'd mean a lot. You get more baseball content like this, not only from me, but from awesome other creators out there as well. So without further ado, let's explore Garver's time with the Rangers, his free agency, and the trade that sent him from Minnesota to Texas. Garver was the Twins' ninth round pick in the 2013 MLB Draft out of the University of New Mexico and was never a highly touted prospect. Garver made his major debut in 2017, mostly playing catcher, but also first base and a little bit of left field. He wasn't on MLB Pipeline's top 30 prospect list when he made his debut and only reached 19th overall in 2018 before he had extended his prospect status only a couple weeks into the MLB season. At that time, people viewed him as a backup catcher. They thought he could potentially stick behind the plate, but he wasn't going to be someone that would be a groundbreaking offensive player or someone who was going to be a plus defender behind the plate, so he'd be someone you just want to have as a good depth piece. Obviously, that's changed significantly, and Garver is in line for a huge payday because he's been able to change that narrative. The best example of this is his 2019 season in Minnesota, his second full year, where he won the Silver Slug Award behind the plate, slashing 273, 365, 630 for an OPS plus of 157, which is an OPS of 995. It's really hard to get an OPS above 1,000, and the fact he was knocking on that door just goes to show you how much he was able to change his perspective as a potential backup catcher to a very solid starting catcher who could provide a lot of offensive value. Although he did strike out about 25% of the time, which isn't phenomenal, but is still decent enough for someone who has a lot of power given that high slugging percentage, his walk rate is something that is somewhat of a redeeming quality. 11.4% isn't elite, but it's certainly very solid and puts him in a class of player who doesn't chase a lot and looks at pitches very well. For a catcher, although he doesn't provide a lot of defensive value and one can argue it's the best defensive position or the most important defensive position in all of baseball, he provides a lot of offensive value and that can offset the fact that he's not the best defender, which we'll talk to in a minute. Since then, he's been somewhat hot and cold. In 2020, he was abysmal with a batting average of 167, significantly below the Mendoza line. Bounced back in 2021 with an OPS plus of 139 before being about pedestrian league average in 2022. In 2023, things came together again. A 270 batting average, 370 on base, and a 500 slugging resulted in OPS of 870 and OPS plus of 134. His average exit velocity was still about 90 miles an hour, and he started to slow down a little bit. He was never a fast guy by any means, but his extra base taken percentage, which basically means how often you stretch a single into a double, dropped from 41% in 2022 to 21% in 2021. So he's not hitting a lot of doubles unless he was really putting the bat in the ball. And that's a big contributor to why his OPS from 2019, another great season of 630, is now 500 when they basically had the same batting average and he got on base a lot more than he did in 2019. We can also talk a little bit about his stat cast data. He's a 98th percentile in chase percentage, meaning he does not chase at pitches outside the zone. He's also 90th percentile in walk percentage, 12.8, which is why I didn't include in that last graphic so I could talk about it here. He has a lot of really positive batting stats, 89th percentile and expected weighted on base, 87th and expected slugging, 83rd and barrel percentage, a lot of positive attributes to his offensive game, 89th and batting run value. 
With a solid catcher in Cal Raleigh already behind the plate, the Mariners can afford to DH Mitch Garver. The offensive value is going to carry him through that two-year $24 million contract, and although he's most likely just going to be a DH and catch only when he needs to, he'll still provide some good value and be a middle of the bat order for a Mariners team that desperately needs it after trading away Jared Kalanick and Eugenio Suarez. Jonah Heim had some value on offense and on defense for the Rangers, and that's why Mitch Garver DH'd a lot and caught when there was a need for a day off. But if you're able to go ahead and only have him day off and DH when you need it with a good defensive catcher who has a good repertoire with your pitchers, I think Garver fits in perfectly there. They were the team rumored to want him the most, and it ends up coming out true that he signs with the Seattle Mariners. The Twins got two players back in this deal, Isaiah kind of left for being one of them, and immediately flipped him to the New York Yankees. That's not the purpose of this trade, but it was the one that sent Josh Donaldson from Minnesota to New York Yankees along with Ben Rodvet in exchange for Gary Sanchez and Gio Urshela. As of the 2023 offseason, only Rodvet is still with those teams even though this deal only happened under two years ago, so I'm not going to discuss this trade in detail, but it's still important to see exactly what IKF got back from the Twins when they traded him and see exactly what he produced with the Yankees. IKF has never been a great offensive player, but that's just kind of what his game has been. In 2023, he put together a 242, 306, 340 slash line for a 78 OPS plus, below average, which is kind of what you expect from him. He's a defender, and part of his ability on the defensive side of the ball is the fact he can play basically anywhere. He is a very good defender. 2020, he won the gold glove, and he's put up very good defensive war numbers across his entire career. 1.5 in 2018, 1.2 in 2020, 2 in 2021, 1.9 in 2022. His value took a big hit and it's going to hurt him in free agency as well because his defensive war fell to just 0.1 in 2023. That I can mostly attribute to the fact that he was used kind of as a super utility guy. He played a lot of games in center, which he had never done before in his career, a lot of games in left field, which he had never done in his career, as well as playing some games at the hot corner. He also was in right field. He pitched for a little bit. He played a game at second, a game at third, just kind of thrown all over. And although he is somewhat of a utility man, he was a catcher early on in his career as well. That's just not sustainable for IKF is. I think now is the perfect time to part ways, and that's exactly what happened as IKF signed a two-year, $15 million deal with the Toronto Blue Jays. He'll most likely fill in a smaller utility role playing second base, playing some outfield, basically just replacing what Whit Merrifield did for the Blue Jays in 2022 and 2023. However, to be a really impact player, he needs to make some improvements on the offensive side of the ball. He has also regressed significantly in terms of his approach at the plate in 2023. If you look at his stat cast data in 2022, he was the 99th percentile top of all players in whip percentage with 11.2% and struck out only 13.6% of all plate appearances, good for 92nd percentile. Although there were some other extremes like the bottom percentage in barrel percent, 1.2, first percentile, and a lot of other below 10 like hard hit percentage, expected slugging, average exit velocity of 86.2. And although those numbers did start to go a little bit toward the mean, barrel percentage over doubled, most of his hard hit, sweet spot, 40th percentile, his whiff and K rate dropped significantly. 81st percentile, 19.6% whiff rate, strikeout weight close to 20. He really did regress a little bit in that regard and that hurt his offensive value. If he can go get more contact on the ball, start whiffing a little less, even though he's good at it, striking out a little bit less, not chasing as much, and getting a little bit more hard contact, he'll be a good player. His ex-WOBA is below league average, and it's probably going to stay that way his entire career, but it's close enough to what it actually is league average that I wouldn't worry about it too much. If he can go get some value back again on the defensive side of the ball, I think he'll be a good addition for a team, most likely a middle-of-the-road, one two-year contract for IKF to go and try and rebound on a team that probably isn't looking to contend, but if he puts together a good year by the trade deadline, I wouldn't be shocked to see him get flipped again. The Twins also acquired a prospect in Ronnie Henriquez, a right-handed pitcher out of the Dominican Republic who signed back in 2017 with the Rangers for only $10,000. The international signing period is really volatile. You're signing 16, 17-year-old kids, and oftentimes the top paid prospects don't end up panning out, and a lot of the guys who don't make a ton of money end up being superstars. Ronald Cunha Jr. is a great example of a player who signed for almost nothing and has become a superstar. And again, it goes the other way. Robert Poisson signed for $5.1 million in 2019, and you've probably never heard of him unless you're an A's fan, and that's just more reason to be sad. Despite being relatively unknown, he put on a clinic when he first joined the Dominican Summer League, striking out 12.3 per 9, which led the DSL that season. As the Rangers continued to develop him, he started to turn into a really good 3-pitch pitcher. 
He has a really good fastball and a slider and changeup that are probably above average. As with a lot of players, his control isn't always there, but he really put together a nice three picks Mitch that will allow him to be a decent pitcher in the major league level. He was called up to the Twins at the end of the 2022 season, pitching three games through a 2-3-1 ERA, striking out nine across 11 and two-thirds innings pitched, putting together a nice solid .094 whip. That's really solid for a guy who is 22 at the time and is still a rookie by prospect standards. During that entire stretch, he served basically as a starter. He's now moved to the bullpen, meaning he spent all of 2023 in the minor leagues, mostly at AAA, besides an injury rehab assignment with the Fort Myers Miracle in high A, and he's put together an okay transition. He came in 37 games, a 5-6-8 ERA across 57 innings pitched, 49 strikeouts, so he's not striking out a ton of guys like he used to, and he's walking a decent amount as well, 36 walks, a whip of 1.58, so it might take a year or two for him to get back into the swing of things as a solid reliever. He's never been a guy that's had a really high ERA, two straight ERAs over five in 2022 and 2021 in the minor leagues, and 2023 became that third consecutive year with an ERA over five. So that's just kind of who he is as a pitcher. It's a nice three-pitch mix, but he'll probably slot in a long relief role. He had a lot of potential to be maybe a back-end starter or a middle or high leverage guy, but he never really got his control under control, ironically, and he's probably going to end up as most as a long relief kind of pitcher. Because of his size, again, he's 5'10", there's some durability concerns as well. He had right elbow inflammation at the beginning of spring training in 2023 and began the season on the injured list, so we'll see exactly how he ends up, but I don't expect him to be a super impactful piece for any Minnesota Twins playoff run in the near future. At the time of the seal, it made sense for both teams. Enriquez was an up-and-coming prospect who had the potential to be a decent relief arm, and with the emergence of Ryan Jeffers, the Twins didn't necessarily need to have a catcher on their roster. IKF has caught in the past, so an emergency third catcher was in effect there, and they flipped him to the New York Yankees and got some more pieces in that regard to help a playoff push that, unfortunately for them, never culminated in a World Series. For Garver, he did exactly what the Rangers wanted him to do, hit home runs and win a championship. For Isaiah kind of for Leffa, the Yankees at one time were excited to have him. Fans have had a mixed opinion of whether he's actually been a good player or not, and he's struggled somewhat at the plate, which can be said for a lot of Yankees players the past couple years, especially since they missed a the playoff last year. But the injection of Juan Soto, Alex Verdugo, Trent Grisham, and a couple other pieces that are likely to sign in free agency, we'll see exactly where the Yankees end up in the future. Both players are at different spots heading into free agency this offseason. Garver, now signing two years, $24 million, was a DH-only player, age 33, who had one of the best years of his career. While IKF, going into his age 29 season, has regressed significantly defensively and doesn't provide a ton of offensive value. With both going to borderline playoff teams, it's going to be really interesting to see exactly how they contribute to a potential World Series run in 2024. For the most part, this deal is kind of over. It's a short-term fix for two teams. One turned out successful for the Rangers. One turned out not so successful for technically both teams involved in the Yankees and the Twins with IKF. Ronnie Henrique still has the potential to go and make an impact at the Major League level, but it seems like that impact is not going to be huge. I could be wrong, and I always love being wrong when I make suggestions like that about a player's future. I hope the best for him. He has a really nice three-pitch mix, and I think he has the potential to be a, a good reliever. He won't be elite. He won't be a middle or high leverage guy, but he has the potential to be solid. Thank you again for watching this video. You can hit one of the two videos that just appeared on your screen to watch more content from me or the baseball right there in the bottom or the link in the description to subscribe to the channel. It really means a lot. Thank you so much and I hope to see you in the next video.